I declare that <laughs> Plato is more concerned with creating a totalitarian state than talking about anything that has to do with aesthetics. <laughs> Period. Yeah, uh, I, I, I can actually, uh, I can agree with Plato's uh, uh, realm of ideas, this, this uh, higher realm. I, I, I think there is uh, some merit to that idea, but to, uh, but to say that uh, the life here on earth is inferior, that's what I have a problem with. Mm. Because I, I, I've been listening uh, recently to a lot of uh, uh, near-death experiences. Uh, have you have you uh, heard uh, people talk about that? Uh, it, it's very it's very interesting. They talk about coming to this other realm and uh, uh, floating up together with other souls, uh, and they meet God or some kind of messenger or angel. And um, and uh, Plato also references uh, uh, a near death experience that happened to Er, uh, who was a soldier. It's called the myth of Er. It happened in antiquity, and uh, and that that realm. It, it might be that that's what happens after we die. That we go to this other reality, and in that way, Plato uh, Plato might be right that there are some some things that are fixed that are not constantly changing, like uh, Heracl uh, Heraclitus uh, talked about. Uh, that. Uh, the soul uh, is, uh, I've heard some people uh, talk about that who have had near-death experiences, that the soul uh, is untainted by what happens here on earth. It's, it's eternal. Our soul mm. is eternal. Mm. And our body is not, of course. But I've also heard people uh, who have had these experiences saying that this is the greatest gift from God to live this life. So why shouldn't we make this life as wonderful as possible? And this is where I'm in total disagreement with Plato. What do you think, Aina? Yeah, I, uh, I guess I'm uh, in a third place from you guys. Uh, <laughs> mm. So uh, I too think that in this case, he's more in the Republic, mm. uh, not that book, but no, in the no, Republic, yeah. that book. He's more concerned with the state. It's a utopia, an ideal state that he wants to create. So that's his main idea to explore how to create that ideal state. He's more concerned with that than art. So art just serves that role in yeah. his state. But also the, 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 the real reality is the ideas, the forms, as Plato talks about, like you said. But I'm not sure it's a sphere of souls that go on to live. It's, it's an ideal of, of more static forms. So, for example, this uh, if you have a, a writing desk, I don't know why, why I came up with that example, but you have a writing desk, and then that has a form that all writing desks are trying to strive for. So the writing desks you have in front of you, the concrete physical writing desk, is an inferior case of that ideal form. And so, it, so the real world is just the, the forms. And then the, the physical world is secondary to that. That's Plato's idea. And, uh, but the forms are, as I read it, more static. So they're not souls. They're more, they're just like ideal forms. Yeah, uh, it doesn't so have to do I, with afterlife. Yeah, it doesn't have to do with the afterlife. So it's an ideal form of a human, for example. Mm. It's an ideal form of a horse. It's an ideal form of a writing desk. And all the things in the world are just inferior copies of that. So that's why he puts less value on the physical world than the ideal. And then he says that the artists are the poets who, who create stories, they, the fictional stories preferably. They, they are even further away from the forms because they copy the writing desk that they mm. see in front of them. Mm. And the writing desk is trying to strive for the form. So the writing desk is one step away from the truth and the poets are two steps away from the truth. Yeah, so we, so we should take the carpenter more seriously. Yeah, so the carpenter is closer to the truth than the art, the, the painter or the, or the... The imitator. Yeah, the mm. ones who imitate the, the, mm. what the carpenter makes. So, so that's his picture of, of poets. And, and they, in the, in the Republic, they're supposed to serve the state in the sense of just creating stories that builds people 
in the roles they're supposed to have in the state. Yeah, but I think... And he wants to censor art. He wants to censor poets so they, so they don't write bad stories because that's going to not work for the ideal state. But I think this is all... I think this is all connected to uh, uh, the, the realm you come to when you die. Because Plato said that uh, as a philosopher, uh, philosophy is preparation for death. And I think it was very inspired by uh, Egyptian culture, which was all about uh, preparing yourself for the afterlife. So people would spend all their money, uh, everything they had, for uh, in order to have the most beautiful burial, with all the um, with all the paintings and little figurines that were supposed to uh, protect you in the afterlife. So. Uh, but I, I, yeah. think of if you come to the afterlife. So yeah. let's say we die, then we move on to the next level. It's like a game. You come to the afterlife. Then I think for Plato, there would have to be forms for that af afterlife to strive for as well. Because if we had fun in the afterlife, there would be some ideals for what we were doing there as well. Yeah. So you would always need that next level. And uh, so, th so that's why you would have the ideal form at the end would just be like, for player, I think it's just the idea of the good. It's like this one grand big form yeah, that but everything I, strives for. But I, I don't think so, because uh, this other realm is eternity, where everything is constant, where everything is the past, everything is the future, and everything is the present. And that's, that's also where the ideal forms must be in eternity, where nothing, nothing changes. Yeah, I, th I do think that they wouldn't change. I'm just not sure what this, where the souls come in. I just don't know what he would say. But uh, I think it's just like this but one, he, but it says, ends with a one big form, the good. But That's he says it. in the allegory of the cave, uh, you know, with the, with the shadows on the wall uh, from the fire and the puppet master, uh, he says in the conclusion of that allegory that uh, the, the light from the fire is the light from the sun. That's how you should understand it. And, and going up from that cave up above to the surface is equivalent of the soul ascending to the heavens and reaching the intellectual realm. Yeah. This is the conclusion in, in the allegory. So I think it's, I, th I, I, I do think it is the same as... We uh, might think of the, the sun, we might think of the sun there when you came, come out of the cave, uh, uh, you see the sun. You might think of the sun as the form of the good. And then we live our lives out there under the sun. So it's still open because he also, other places, he thinks of uh, uh, incarnation so you can relive. So in other dialogues, he says that all knowledge is just remembering things that you've already learned in prior mm. lives. So you go through these cycles of many lives and you relive in another physical realization mm. uh, the same soul or whatever it is and mm. so so when you learn something you just remember what you already knew from a different life so he has these cycles but uh my interpretation of Plato is just that the forms are more to just end up with this one big static form i mean it's mysterious what the forms are but it, it's just it, i think it always needs to be another level of form so you have to end with the 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 form Somewhere. And it's because of these forms that he can depict the painter and the poet as morally uh, problematic. Yeah. Uh, and it <clears throat> it's surprised me because we, you sort of all know about this thing that the painter is copying the copy of the copy and all these things, and that's why it's lower. But uh, it's also a question of mor morale. And uh, it is quite striking that he doesn't acknowledge at all the effect an emotional experience can have on your ethics. I mean, yeah. just seeing a painting, uh, uh, talking about uh, um, um, it, I'm the Terrible Killing a Son by Repin. Yeah. And you see that and you think, holy, I don't, don't want to come in that situation. That can really shock you. And it's so strange that it doesn't uh, acknowledge that aspect of it. And even in music, I mean, yeah. uh, Alan Peterson's Seventh uh, Symphony. Certainly. Uh, I had a, a strong, strong uh, uh, period with that symphony. And... It inspired me. I wanted to become a better person mm. because of that symphony, and that's yeah. 
And then it's uh, really something uh, life transforming. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when you look at uh, what Plato says in this different, well, in Eon, in State, and uh, um, Symposium, it, basically what he's talking about, or he is sort of like, like the first kitsch critic. Because yeah. what is the problem he has is that it, that a painting or a, a uh, tragedy exploits the emotions of the viewer, and he sees that as problematic because it just appeals to what is. It's easy to make something that is dramatic because people will like it, and you can make money, and then you get that same argument around it. Well, he, what, what he reacts to is that uh, you can enjoy seeing suffering on the stage, but you wouldn't enjoy it if it happened to yourself or yeah. someone you knew in real life, and he sees that as problematic. But I don't understand why that is a problem. Well, because uh, you're, uh, just, you're just recognizing uh, a part of what it is to be a human being. It's not that you enjoy the suffering yeah. that is happening on the stage. So, so that's basically Aristotle's take on it, right? So, yeah. So he says you need to experience all these feelings to prepare yourself for the real life. Yeah, it so can, it's a good preparation plan to live a good life. Is to it can get you in balance. Yeah, go to a play, experience yeah. some emotions that you wouldn't experience otherwise. Yeah. You become a more of a whole person. Uh, you learn to recognize things in yourself. You you learn by it. You grow, and and Plato doesn't see that part. I think. Yeah, I mean, but, but it's really how do you say it? It's, he goes into this absurd detail sometimes, where he talks about a well, he talks about the poet, I guess. How <clears throat> if you have these um, um, lines, the figure has a line, yeah. that is impersonating that figure which can easily make the audience you know, uh, empathize and live into what the per person is doing. So you should have very little of that and a lot of narration because narration is the distance to what is happening. Uh -huh. It's just reporting. And I, I wasn't aware that he was so specific about it. So yeah, he did, he yeah. doesn't, doesn't like dialogue. No, 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 because then it becomes uh, living, right? If you just describe it, it's uh, is at uh, one foot distance, not close yeah. in your face, right? So there is this aesthetical indifference that he has to have in there so it doesn't creep. You should just educate you and show that this is good um, good morals. You should just imitate good actions or good people and describe the rest. So a little bit of uh, lines, but mostly narrative. Yeah, lines. Narration. Yeah, dialogue, yeah. Dialogue. dialogue but, uh, yeah. <laughs> all we have from Plato are dialogues. <laughs> but yeah, well, he but he uses it for a greater good. Yeah, that's true. So can, can I say what my problem with Plato is? Please. <laughs> So I, I thought about this uh, um, on the way here because in Ion, the, which is an early dialogue, he he makes fun of Ion, which is a he's a he's not a poet, but he re rhapsode. yeah he's a actor, rhapsode. Right? He he recites yeah. poetry. Yeah. Uh, so he knows Homer. Homer. He knows him very well. He knows everything about that uh, about those uh, epic uh, pieces, and so he makes fun of him because he thinks he knows something. So, so in, in Ion, uh, Plato sort of makes fun of the poets because they think they know what they're talking about. And poets don't really, according to Plato in that dialogue, know what they're talking about because they're just imitating something. Mm. And so if you imitate a, a, a pair of shoes, you don't know what it's like to walk in them. You just imitate what you see. Them. You don't know what, how to make them. You don't know anything about shoes. You mm. just imitate what you see. And you just get one angle of them. You get, it's a very inferior picture he makes fun of. Uh, so... He claims that the poets are like are are not necessarily lying, but they're they're, they're giving us an illusion, and they, they don't really know what they're talking about. But he also says that they're they're there's the real poets, the good ones. They speak, God speaks through yeah. them. So it's a divine inspiration yeah. that they get. It's kind of a contradiction there, but yeah. so he shouldn't. You should enthusiasmos. Yeah. So as as a poet, you shouldn't think rationally. You should just let God speak through you. It's like mm -hmm. a. So if you think of it in our terms, less with God and all, all that, you just think of like some people just have a natural inclination to do better at something than others. Yeah. Some people are just more musically. Some people are just more poetic. Some people are more are just better at mm. something. Yeah, Kant nature. and the German idolists, they, they brought this back to life. Yeah, so, so that's one way in, in Ion. Uh, but in the Republic, he goes on to say that uh, with these three, the poets are three steps from the forms like we talked about but my problem with it is that i don't have much of a problem with ion my problem is with the republic picture because there he he has this picture of a poet and by poet he means any 
creative act where you create a story of some kind. Mm. Uh, and his, he says that what they do is they imitate the physical world, right? So this is the mimesis concept that uh, Aristotle and they were all mm. talking about, to imitate the physical world. And of course, to a certain extent, you do that when you paint or write poetry and so on. But the good painters and the good poets, they don't just paint this glass. Yeah. They paint this glass so they show you the, the glass or the glassness or the essence of a glass uh, in the painting. Or the ideal form. The ideal <laughs> form, that's my point. Yeah. So, so you sort of like the good painters, they, they don't just paint Bork when they paint a portrait of him. They paint him so you can see it's him. So in that sense, they imitate a little bit. But the, the good ones are the ones where you see there's a human there. There's a person, there's that guy, but there's also something more. Mm. And that raises the art up a level. And then, of course, on the platonic picture, you can think of it as the good painters and poets. They, they don't imitate the second step. So you have the form, you have the physical object, and then you have the painting. They don't imitate this one in the middle. They go directly, the good ones, go directly to the forms. And they use this as just a means to get there. So when you do a really good painting, you actually get closer to the forms than you do to the physical objects. So Plato seems to misunderstand what good art does. It doesn't, he seems to be thinking of a good painting as just someone who copies the physical thing in front of them. And that's the cheap trick. That's just a technique you can learn. But the good ones go beyond that, right? They, they manage to show something more. But it, and then you can think of it, you know, I think Plato could do much better on his own platonic picture if he thought this way. Because then he could use his forms to explain better what good art is. But he doesn't seem to get it. He, he's, he thinks the artists just copy the physical world. Mm. which is the bad artists who do that. So that's my problem with Plato. He could have done much better. He could have been more of a platonic thinker than he is. <laughs> well, but, but, but he, does, he does say that uh, if the poetry serves the state, then, uh, then we can allow it into the city-state. Well, it, yeah, but then it becomes just a use thing. It's like a, a functional thing. Just yeah, do so this say, no, to no, but that. he actually says, he says, if it can serve both pleasure and uh, use, or what's the Renaissance uh, uh, oh, saying? Yeah. Please and instruct. Yeah, yeah. If it can both please and instruct, we can allow it into the city-state. Yeah. And and that's actually okay. Now we're actually talking here. I yeah. mean, th this is this is the Renaissance ideals or, yeah. or or the Greek ideals that something should both both please the eye and teach you something. Yeah. So yeah. he actually says that, but then of course he says a lot of other things. Yeah, because I don't, I don't see that because it's, uh, you can't reach what you're talking about if you're following Plato's idea that, well, you mustn't try to, to dramatize and grip people's yeah. audience because then you're using, the, the, that, that's a cheap trick. There's too much right? censorship. So you you cannot state. create something that is really gripping no, so the question, following Plato. The question is, what does he mean when he says, please and instruct? Yeah, yeah. and what, uh, what does he actually want? Because I mean, so, you yeah. have this idea. I mean, someone has. I read this uh, French philosopher once. Once. Uh, yeah, <laughs> once. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> it's a smick drop. Uh. Okay. Uh, who talked about how Plato, apparently, if it was a, an exact copy, then he could accept it. But if it was sort of manipulating mm. forms and so, it wasn't acceptable. Yeah. Uh, but then when you read Plato, it's obviously he doesn't even like that because that's, no. even though it's an exact copy, it's just from that angle. It's mm -hmm. not the table, as if a painter was a, a table maker. Honestly, I don't think he yeah. likes anything about life. Yeah, yeah that's uh, like, like, what, the, what does he want? Because no, I mean, uh, he wants the I truth. You, I, he wants the truth. Like I said, yeah. he, he sees philosophy as a preparation for death. Yeah. But, but then this again, you, sh you should go back to an Ivan the Terrible. I think that's a great preparation for but, death. But he also wants truth. He has this like inclination to just the That's truth. a problem. Yeah. So he says among, in the Republic, he says, you shouldn't let people stand in the way of the truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you just shoot so them down so if they stand in the way of the truth. He's very uh, authoritarian in the Republic when oh, he wants to yeah. create the ideal state. Yeah. So the poets just need to do what they do. But the interesting thing is that you can imagine a poet or an artist of some kind, someone who creates something, serving the state and still does an excellent job. So like uh, Da Vinci, for example, he served dictators and horrible leaders, yeah. but he did great jobs. He, he created great stuff. So, so you can do it 
I think you can, to some extent, um, reach for the forms, even within the... So if, you, if the dictator tells you to paint him, he says, paint me, then you can paint him in a good way and you can paint him in a bad way, even <laughs> though you are instructed to paint him. Even if he says, paint me as a great leader, don't make me weak. You can paint him as a great, make a great painting of him as an authority and authoritarian great leader, right? Oh, you can use him as a stepping stone to create something that yeah, has nothing so, to do with. But but well, so, but but uh, it, in order to really capture a human face, you have to show some of the vulnerability in that human and face. And then, <laughs> yeah, that's a big problem for a leader. Yeah, that's a big problem for Plato, obviously. Yeah, but then then in some ways you cannot uh, reach the highest level and portray. A great leader and satisfy this leader. Yeah, I concur. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I just I sort of like the picture that Plato gives us when it's thought of as I interpret it. So when you think of the great artist as sidestepping the middle level, so they go via the physical objects, but they go for the forms. Yeah, I sort of like that picture. I think his, if he had said that, it would have been a cool picture. Yeah, but there's a reason why he didn't. He didn't he, understand art. No, but I think. <laughs> If you look at if you look at Egyptian culture, uh, why is it so? Uh, you could say why is it so stylized? Why is it so badly made or so stiff? Well, I think it's because they di they didn't want their worship of death to be disturbed by life. How wonderful life is! Yeah, yeah. How, how living things can be because then you forget your duties as the citizen and you forget. Uh, to think about death mm. because you're so concerned with life. I mean, and so there's something to what you're saying with the preparation for death because this is, so, among other things, the criticism that Nietzsche gives to Plato is that he's always concerned with what's not here. So his main yeah. concern is with the next level. It's the forms, it's not the physical object, it's the afterlife, it's not the re this life. He's always concerned with the next level rather mm. than the one that's here. And the natural reaction is, of course, then his pupil, Aristotle, who says, well, we should be concerned with what's here. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that's a natural yeah. reaction uh, when you're too concerned with what's elsewhere. And uh, just look at, look at the um, reception of Plato, uh, the Dark Ages in Europe, uh, with, uh, with the high priests as his philosopher kings telling people what is the truth. Uh, I mean, it, this, is a, this is a catastrophe, what happens when you put Plato's philosophy into practice through Augustine and Plotinus. And I think uh, St. Augustine has the beautiful, uh, the beautiful golden mean, which is because he, with his philosophy, reintroduced uh, Aristotle and uh, Aristotle's philosophy to Europe and it created the Renaissance. But the beautiful thing about St. Augustine... Uh, oh, so, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. Th Thomas yeah. Aquinas. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, Thomas Aquinas, he introduced the concepts natural law and the law of eternity. And he's, if I have understood it correctly, he said that natural law, we have to, we have to follow natural law when we live on earth. When we die, we, we follow the law of eternity. And so we don't mix those two. Mm. And that's what, that's what essentially Plato wants us to do. He wants us to mix eternity and nature, which do not have that much to do with each other. Mm. They're two separate things. Yeah, and I'm thinking also that there's a, there's a big, I don't know if it's an elephant in the room, but it's, it's really noticeable when you read e e Ion, and also in the state, I think, uh, this concept of Socratic irony which is the most manipulative uh, way of discussing, quote-unquote, that you can ever encounter. I mean, when he talks with Eon, and it starts off with saying that, that uh, Eon doesn't know anything. So there's, there's no discipline called acting and, and uh, declaiming poetry. Like, that's not a skill at all. He just sidesteps that completely. Well, what he actually yeah. starts by saying is that... Uh, um, because Ion calls him a wise man, and then Socrates yeah. says, "Oh no! Oh, I'm not. I'm not wise like you." Uh, I just you, say the truth. The yeah, yeah, I just say the truth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. So he does that, it's and then mean dialogue. It, 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 yeah. But it's. I mean, it's so embarrassing on behalf of Plato 
that he makes it so easy for himself. Here's a guy who is sort of a bit high on himself, I guess, yeah. but he's, he's skilled, but he's a bit naive, and then of course Socrates just yeah. plays with him, right? Mm -hmm. And, and Socrates sort of oh, sits like that and, and is proud afterwards that he won over Ion. I mean, mm. what the hell is going on? And, and, and then he does this thing that he does several times where he says, I, I, Ion is saying, I am good at declaiming Homer and interpreting him. He didn't say, I know how to uh, race a horse and chariot. But then Plato or Socrates says, oh yeah, you described that scene from Homer with the uh, horse chariot race, but you don't know how to race a uh, horse. Oh, well, then you don't know anything. Yeah. Uh, you have to, you that's, have that's lovely. Therefore, you cannot perform Homer. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it, it's, but you have to remember, this is a, probably an early dialogue of Plato. So he was young. So yeah, he too was perfecting his skills of writing dialogues, right? Yeah, that's, what, uh, that that's, what, uh, that's what uh, 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 good-willed people want like to me, think like me but, yeah, I mean, yeah. is it, no, is no, it very there different are, there are indications that it's a later work <laughs> but if it, yeah I, that's what i've uh, read too but yeah. i mean is it is that very different from how socrates behaves later i mean is, is it i don't know i'm not a plato scholar but i mean i think the ion is more of a fun dialogue it's a bit like caricatured and fun and he makes fun of this young eager uh, quasi artist who, who wants who, who's high on himself and he, he just like crushes him like an old man can do to these young people. And yeah. I think it's just like, it's a fun dialogue. It's, it's fun to read the way he crushed it because he made some good points. I mean, there's the, a couple of subtle good points. I mean, one point is that he says, well, you know Homer very well. Can, do you know these other poets and other yeah. people? Hesiod. And he goes, no, I don't know them that well. But you know the good and stuff, bad in Homer, but I'm not so really. interested in them. And he's like, you can't just know that he's good without knowing the other ones who are bad. Mm. So you have to know the whole skill of writing, basically, in order to yep. know that. Yeah, but but mean, he, he, he confuses that. He doesn't say, well, you have to know the skill of writing and how that is... is uh, no, the, way, the way Socrates yeah. uh, 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 explains this in the end is that uh, Ion is... Um, that God is speaking through him, and that's mm. why he's obsessed with Homer. It's an obsession from God. Yeah, or, but, I mean, a God. So he basically says you sh should stop thinking you know more than you do just do what you're good at and don't talk so much about it that's the moral i read out of it and it's a good advice it's like he's good at, if he's good at citing reciting homer do that don't think yeah, you know I mean, work or fighting or but it's too stupid because he's tricking him into saying in the end that he knows how to to be a warlord or a general yeah. at war and in the beginning uh, it's just a question of, of uh, uh, being able to speak like a general would have to speak to, to incite his, his uh, uh, warriors. And then Socrates manipulates that into having Eon admitting that he could be a general. So it's just mm. Eon not being that intelligent and yeah, then he, he wins that cheap but uh, he victory. Wins. Right? He wins. <laughs> but he wins. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, think there's, I think it's a good point that you can, you shouldn't think you know more than you do and i think it's a good point that you shouldn't think that if you can know the quality of a sub genre if you don't know the bigger picture so so you can't know that these handful of painters in abstract paintings are really good if you don't know the rest of the painting yeah. around and the history and culture you have to have an overview to really know what you're talking about and yeah. i think that's a good but that, that's, that's a good that's, point. That's fine. I mean, if uh, that's what he, that's what that's Ion why messes we should, up. That's why we should know all of Plato's works to talk about Plato. I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. I, I mean, ideally, you should be in Plato's scholar to talk about Plato. Maybe I don't think so. You should. We should all be allowed to talk about it, but we should be humble, like Arist mm -hmm. uh, like um, Socrates teaches us. Mm. Well, he he's not so humble though. No. He's humble in a in a sarcastic way. <laughs> well, yeah. That's like the paradox of Socrates, right? That he he's humble, but he's not. He's arrogant, but he doesn't know anything. That's the interesting feature of that character. He well, he know claims to know the truth. Well, just... he says he doesn't know anything, <laughs> but the fact that he knows but the truth. nothing. Oh. Socrates says that. So, yeah, it's. I guess that's why it's interesting. But it's yeah. strange that that. Um, how empathy is made suspicious because that's one of the things that that uh, socrates does in eon where he says that 
So you, you're just you're uh, what do you call it? Declaiming, you're citing from Homer, and you see this scene going on so so vividly that that you get goosebumps and you, you feel it as if it's happening to you. It's just, do we not call such a man crazy? Is he is he really well kept? And that is such a strange point, that that experience experiencing empathy with something that is happening in a painting or in a uh, tragedy says that you're crazy. So isn't that a basic human virtue or, or, is, or a yeah, virtue that you're able to empathize with other people? But he makes it into something really negative. Yeah. But I mean, he has other places where he says that the, the body and the soul needs to be in harmony. So yeah. the emotional and the rational part of you needs to be in harmony. So you shouldn't let the feelings overrun, overrule you. Yeah. And you shouldn't let the rationality overrule your feelings. Uh, mm. So you should be some kind of harmony, right? And that's a well, um, that's it healthy has a advice. Uh, common with Aristotle. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so, I, but Plato is the rationalist of the two mm -hmm. kings. This is a battle of kings. You have Plato and Aristotle. And Plato is the rationalist. So he f puts most focus on rational thought. And Aristotle is more of an empiricist. So he puts more focus on this like observation and seeing what's actually going on and describing that and see how, what you can do with that. Uh, and is as we said, more focused on the here and now, and Plato looks ahead. Yeah, but uh, so, so, I mean, it's natural that he doesn't say empathy is super important because he's focusing on the rational thought. And then Aristotle says, no, you need to worry about your emotions as well. <laughs> so it makes sense, but I mean, it's... it's uh, well, but look at, uh, look at Stasi, uh, Germany, uh, for example. It was a very, very uh, gray time. Like people were walking around in these gray dresses and they didn't have an emotional life kind of, at least on the outset. And uh, if, if, you, if you watch dramatic plays or, or, or comedies which make you laugh a lot, I think Plato's big worry is that you, you forget your duties as a citizen. You forget to uh, uphold your duties to the state. And mm -hmm. then the state will fall apart because you're uh, dealing with uh, just nonsense in his eyes. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there, there's a red thread here. I remember reading about um, early Norwegian cultural politics, like in the very early in the 1800s, where Norway was becoming a state. And from the very beginning, there was this one man was very instrumental. And he was very clear about that. We shouldn't leave art or culture to the private market because the state needs to control the morale mm. of the citizens. So it's, it's more of a, well, as you pointed out, it's more of a state ruling idea than, than the aesthetics in that sense. But I mean, it's, it's very strange that he, his idea of these emotions, but I think you're right in describing the problem for the state if you, the emotions become too private. Because it talks about how if you read them about people who, are do, who do um, evil things or are not, not good people, then that's like a ideal for you and you start behaving like that. And I'm thinking, well, what then about uh, crime and punishment by Dostoevsky? That wouldn't be allowed in Plato's state. No. To read about Raskolnikov and his ideas, oh, am I going to kill someone? And then he kills these two uh, old women. Uh, but then that does, doesn't fit at all. Like, that's a very poor life. But, but I, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think we all should we should remember that the Republic is is a utopic state, right? So he tries yeah. to give a picture of an ideal state or an imaginary state. Uh, so it's not it's not clear whether he thinks this is something that we should even try to realize. It's, he just says it's sort of like a thought experiment. Wouldn't this be a great idea, or wouldn't this work as a great st uh, state? And it's not clear that he actually thinks this. Is something we should go for. So you say you don't necessarily take Plato literally when you read the Plato. Republic, because mm. in Specific other dialogues, he says. So if you read, for example, my favorite dialogue of Plato is Socrates' Apology. Mm. So it's his, the speech he gives when he's sentenced to death. Socrates gives a defense and he gives a speech, and in it he basically says he gives a defense uh, for him as an individual being allowed to be authentic, being what he needs to be to and do what he needs to do. And Socrates says, I could never 
not do what I do. I, you could let me out, but I won't admit that this was wrong because I think I'm right and you guys are wrong. And he basically says, I could not be part of a political party. I could not be part of the war. I could not be part of politics because I would be killed right away because I would always object. Mm. I would always say the wrong things. I would always speak up against the majority. I would be this, I think the metaphor is, is this bug on the society. Uh, which is, so the society is like a sleeping horse and he's the bug who keeps it awake. And I think mm. that's a defense for basically free speech and and being allowed to be yourself. And that's another dialogue, which is probably the best player dialogue, I think. But that's totally clashing with the Republic. Mm. Oh, yeah. Because the Republic is saying that those people, we're going to basically kill them. Uh, <laughs> we, we can't allow that kind of stuff. To Maybe. raise kids right, to get them in the right positions in the state, you need to raise them this and this way. It's an authoritarian, censored society from begin birth to death. And... I don't think it doesn't make sense to read the rest of Plato and, and think that he thought the Republic was what we should go for. But maybe maybe he wanted to act like a provocateur against uh, Glaucon and see his reactions. Yeah, so I mean, so there's a lot of sarcasm and irony and all this like Socratic irony. It's hard to know what to take seriously and what to take literally and what's just like mm. a fun dialogue. And in the Ion, he's crushing this poor young guy, and in the Republic, it's this like authoritarian, crazy state. But then, you know, the, like the, the apology is just like this deep humanistic manifest uh, for a good life. So I, I think it's, we shouldn't necessarily think that the artists or the poets will be killed by Plato. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, uh, but still, the, <laughs> if we look at what, uh, what happened uh, after Plato, they did base... Uh, the Dark Ages in Europe were very much based on his teachings. Yeah, but people, uh, yeah. Te you know, take texts and interpret it weirdly. Like, look at what happened to yeah. Nietzsche. He hated, you know, socialism, fascism, and racism, and all the socialist, fascist, racists took him in to their hearts. <laughs> so, I mean, people interpret these things. Yeah, but I think wrong uh, afterwards. But as a comparison, uh, I think Aristotle would be very di difficult to interpret in, 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 a, uh, in a manner where it would have very unfortunate consequences. I mean, like uh, his, his, uh, uh, his politics. I don't think you could make like a tyrannical uh, uh, state. Uh, based the on Catholic Church basically built on Aristotle. Uh, they have some tyrannical... Well, well, but they lines came, with thought through history. Well, they, they came out of the dark ages <laughs> yeah. and into a better time. So, um, well. yeah. but I mean, I, I think it's it's it, we shouldn't. Bl my point is just that we shouldn't blame the original uh, writer for how it's interpreted later. No. Uh, so we should be careful to you know read the Republic and see what's going on. And of course, it's like. Uh, who has the responsibility when someone is executed? In my opinion, it's the ex executioner, not the judge. The guy who actually yeah. pulled the trigger? Yeah. Well, but that would be your point, wouldn't it? No. no? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, no, because Plato is the, is the judge and uh, the executioner No, is it's more like an artist, right? So you paint a painting or you write a poem and then some crazy guy interprets in a different way. And I don't think that's my fault or the poet's fault, right? That's the crazy guy who interpreted it wrong. Uh, but if a, if, if a judge says he's guilty, sentenced to death, and you're just a puppet serving the state, yeah. then it's less your responsibility. I'm just doing my job. Yeah. But I, I think uh, the artist should just be free to create something. And then when you leave it to the public domain, who knows what's going to happen. But isn't the difference between Plato and Aristotle that, that Plato has this moralistic idea and Aristotle is just concerned with what are the basic needs of the discipline. I'm talking about the poetics. So, um, what are the basic needs of the discipline? How can you judge quality? And that's it. There's no moralization about if you should tell a story or not. It's just, well, do your best. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, to some extent. I mean, in the poetics, he also has this idea of the art, the the, the tragedy, which is the one he discusses there, that it has this, uh, serves this uh, educational purpose in society, right? So, so when you write a great tragedy and you go see it, you become a better person. 
Uh, so the great tragedies portray people who are better than us, and then something happens bad to them. Uh, and then we're supposed to look up to them and empathize with them, and then you know, feel empathy for them and realize that this is horrible and it might happen to me. And, and so it has an educational purpose, at art. So there's some moralizing in that, right? No, but it doesn't yeah, tell but, you but particularly not, It's right. not moralizing over the one who is making the story. Yeah, that's right. He is acknowledging that this is a person who has skill, the skill of telling that story. He's not saying that uh, uh, Melville is a bad writer because he doesn't know anything about whaling. Well, yeah. actually he did so. That's why he's a good <laughs> author, because he did whaling himself. You think Moby Dick is a good book? I do. <laughs> But, uh, but I just like it. If you talk about other books, I, I just fall off. Yeah, I'm not interested. <laughs> I mean, mm. the Moby Dick is a fun case because mm. I think the middle of it is really boring because he goes all into all these details about fishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if he knew less about whale fishing, that might have been a better book <laughs> because he knew too much. So he was giving us all these details <laughs> about funny. ropes and, and how, what they did with the whales. And, well, perhaps he and it's boring had, uh, to the rest of us. He should have had a factory uh, like... Uh, mm. Alexander Dumas, where he yeah. brought in a lot of people who knew a little bit about different things and they brought it into the book and yeah, it yeah. became a whole. Yeah. Ghostwriters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but speaking of Ion, I, I think I was, just to finish off with uh, Moby Dick, I think I really got into, into it because I heard this fantastic recording by an actor, or he, reading of it. And then it was, wow, I see that guy could read the phone catalog as uh, all it says, and it would be in interesting, mm -hmm. but okay, yeah. I but I mean, that's a skill. Yeah, but I mean it's interesting to connect it to Plato yeah. because mm. I think in that book, particularly mm. Moby Dick, it would have been a better book if he knew less about fishing. Well, so that, that proves Plato's point. <laughs> but do you if remember you <laughs> remember what uh, Melville writes about the Plato worshippers? No. <laughs> so they're going up in the top of the mast to look for whales, but then they just see the eternal rolling of being, yeah. and they stand there, and then the ship goes like this from side to side, and suddenly then. They hit the, the surface of the water and they never come up again. And they never <laughs> because replay they, they, to again, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Because reality hits them in the face. So. Yeah. <laughs> but what... Uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering about one thing. I'm constantly wondering about it. Perhaps it's possible to figure it out uh, by reading Plato somewhere. But why... Uh, because he says that uh, philosophy is a preparation for death and the philosopher kings should rule the city-state. So there is a, a, an important connection here. How is how is the um, how is the Republic Plato's Republic uh, preparing you for death? Uh, you really want to die if you live in that state? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I'm I'm wondering about yeah. this because that that was the goal to mm. prepare yourself for death. I, it's very obvious to me that he took this from Egyptian culture, which also was. Uh, which was based a little bit in the same way that it was a quite, quite tyrannical elite mm. that controlled. But isn't the, the the state about preparing yourself for the state, not for death? No, but the state cannot be a purpose in itself. That's that mm. comes with communism. Yeah, well, I just never got stuck on this preparing for death. I know that's yeah. a thing in Plato, but I just always just ignored it. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> because we're insensitive. <laughs> No, but if, if you but what does it mean? The, the like, allegory of the cave. Mm. Uh, but what does it mean? Why, how am I preparing myself point. for death? Hmm? What does it mean? How, how, do, how do I prepare myself for death? Is it for a better life afterwards? Because there's yeah. some, some lines of thought that's, in Christianity where sure. you have to behave. This life is all about getting in the right place afterwards. So basically that's a way of preparing for death. So life yeah. now, do this and this and this, because then you come to the good place. Uh, that's a way of thinking of this life being a preparation for death. Is that how Plato? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering about. Does he have a bullet list, like mm. uh, what you have to do to uh, get uh, a good afterlife? Uh, would be interesting to see. We should have a well, in that story about, scholar, yeah. story about air at the end of uh, book 10 of the, the state, it talks about how the people, there's the people that die and either go up or down. They, yeah. uh, they, uh, they go to some kind of middle state. Yeah, they, well, they, they, yeah, and then they are uh, rewarded or, or punished. But then there are people coming down and up. Mm. And they have to choose new lives. Yeah. And uh, he talks about how the people have gone to heaven. Everything was fine, you know. And so they, 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 they just choose because they haven't really experienced really rough things. And so they end up like a tyrant or, or a, and don't read the little uh, writing where it says, well, it implies that you have to eat your children. Yes. And, yes, then, yes. Then, yeah. and then the people who have, who have come up from the underworld 
they know the empathy with yeah. uh, how the life was and so they they would rather choose to be a farmer or somewhere i think it's it's the, the ghost of odysseus who chose chooses to be a farmer in some remote area that no one knows about so so mm. stalin was probably a, a very good man yeah in, in his, his previous his life. previous life yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> good Why are you choking? That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something a little bit more metaphysical about Plato? Mm. So, about the forms. So you've always you you're concerned about preparing for death. So I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more concerned with what the forms are. Yeah. So what what are these forms? These ideas that he talks about. But, but so the, yeah, what okay. what are they supposed to be? And back to the picture we had earlier where the, where the painter, for example, let's use painting as an example. The painter tries to paint the form of Bork rather than just Bork when he paints you, right? So he goes straight for the heavens rather than the physical object. And in that case, I'm, I'm interested in what the forms are, right? So what is it you capture when you capture the forms or get closer to them? And a natural way to think of it is it's just when I paint a portrait of you, to use you an example, I paint a portrait of you, I, if I manage to raise it towards that level, I sort of capture the exact amount of information needed to capture you as a person rather than irrelevant details. So the good artist is the one who managed to abstract what I need from your face to capture you so it looks like you, but not just that, because then I can add all kinds of irrelevant details. But I capture exact information from your face, get it on the canvas, and then I see you, but I also see something more. So it's finding that balance of perfect information to capture sort of the essence of you. That's what the form is. If you think of it like that, then forms is just information. And if of course, the word are connected. Yeah. Form mm -hmm. and information. It means information, inform. Mm. So it basically means to be in a form. And when I capture the form of you, I literally capture the form of you. And that's what the forms are. It, and that's a very natural way of thinking of it. And then the great artists should they should love Plato. <laughs> and he should love them uh, to some extent. But he uh, doesn't. Yeah, but, I, I understand what you're talking about. But that's what you're capturing. And Finding that balance is the master. You abstract away from the concrete details. So I get yeah. the ideal you. But I don't get too abstract because then I lose you. So I need to find that perfect balance. And that's, I think that's exactly what I think good artists do. They manage to get that perfect balance. Well, you have to, but I, I, you have to have pathos too. And that's why you, you cannot follow Plato to go there. That's true. Yeah. So you need the yeah. feel. You need, so but I'm, not only that, it's also another problem. Because Plato says in the allegory of the cave, the prison house is the world of sight. We are living in a prison. Our senses are fooling us. It's, it's an illusion which we shouldn't pay too much attention to. Yeah. Uh, but you do get so, the glimpses. So, so the ideal forms are up there in the other realm when you die. Yeah, because I mean, you couldn't... You're back to death. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> when you look, look at Greek sculptures, it's all that, uh, not idealistic, but it is a, a, it's not a specific person, never. Um, but I mean, if I wouldn't describe that as, an, as a concretization of platonic form, because platonic form doesn't exist in reality. So whenever you... Not according to Plato. <laughs> when, when you get that, it cannot be Platonic. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I see what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. No, because, so it, because if that exists up there somewhere yeah. and you start, the minute you concretize it, it cannot be the form per yeah. definition. No, 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 that's true. So, so I, I agree with so, that. I mean, this yeah. is just what Aristotle is talking about. This is this thing about finding the universal, not to be the, the journalist who is the naturalist, but to find the universal in that human being. Yeah. I mean, so this is the classic debate between the two. Aristotle and Plato, mm. like he thinks the forms exist independently of the physical world, mm. and Aristotle thinks it's dependent on the physical yeah, world. But isn't, so, isn't it quite so? In that sense, it's true. You can't get the form on the canvas because it's actually in a different realm. So yeah. you can't literally get it. Well, on that's the, the whole point that you're removing yourself from the form one more step. Yeah. But I think the, the on the I think what you do get is you get the artist, the good artist, to get 
closer to the form because the forms are ideals. No, but it's so, you, so you sort of like get closer to them because I think even Plato would say that there are better and worse examples of a horse, for example. So you have the idea of a horse, the form, and then you have the horses. And some horses are just closer to the ideal than other horses. He would say that. A crippled horse. A crippled horse would be less close to the... <laughs> you said it! <laughs> so, uh, it's <laughs> according to Plato. So, uh, I think you can get the degrees. And, and then, I, my point is that the good artist should strive as far as possible towards the forms, if you like the platonic picture. But personally, I would just remove the platonic realm altogether and just talk about information. Yeah, because I think you easy. so easily get to, I mean, of course, I understand you can, it's so broadly formulated that you can angle it in quite different ways, but you can e easily say that Matisse reaches the form because it's not a specific person, right? There's, yeah. it's yeah, what, completely... What, could you say which form he captures? I the think form of human being, which is not one concrete person. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean that that would be the argument for modernism. Right? Yeah, I mean I, I think, and I I would say I I think you could say that the more the person the, the painter captures what you call the form, you would actually say, have to say that that person is further away from the form, in some way. But I understand also you could see Plato as saying that, of course, like for example, if it's an exact copy, he's saying that that's not a good thing. But again, the important thing is that what the painter does or the poet does supports state morals. So today, for example, you can have photorealism, which would be perfect because it doesn't tell you something about personal vulnerability. It's just some flat, completely indifferent uh, expression or lack of expression. I was, I, uh, I was thinking independent of the state now. I was, not, okay, I yeah. was just thinking yeah. like you could... Uh, I was just trying to be friendly towards a platonic picture for an artist mm. uh, that you can you can approach it and get closer to it and make sense of it uh, as something that's not just I wasn't thinking of serving the state but no, no. I agree with I think both of you that it 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 would lack the emotional aspect because it doesn't talk about that but you could just add that to the picture and say well when you approach the form in a painting for example and I I recognize the I'm touching the mic here. I recognize the, the the face of Bork in the painting, and I, in addition, I see some deep humanity in the painting, and it touches me because that's just the way we humans work. We mm -hmm. we get touched by the truth. And because I think it's Plato, sort of not just Bork; it's you also. Yeah. yeah. So you see. So I think even Plato is touched by the truth. I mean, he that's what he puts the highest. Mm. So when you see the truth, the forms, you, you we're moved. It's beautiful. It's like the truth is the same as the beautiful, basically. And then that makes sense. That makes a holistic sense of Plato. But it does rest on the question, as you were touching, I think, of what the kind of forms there are and how many. Mm. So, for example, how fine-grained and coarse-grained are the forms? Is well, there, it says clearly is there one form one. for humanity? Uh -huh. But it does say that. And the good? Yeah. Yeah, the one good form. Because if yeah. there are several forms of different tables, then there should be a form for the forms. Yeah. And in the end, it's just uh, one, the good, yeah, which yeah. is the form. But th there's a big debate about how to individuate the forms. So when I, uh, for example, uh, if I paint Bork again, you, you can have the form of a person there. You could have the form of Bork probably as well, which is the individual forms of individuals. And there's a big debate about what he thinks of that. And mm. the, more f the more forms there are, the more you're idea of modernism can say can join the team right uh, because okay, they just yeah. paint something weird and then they say well it's a form it's a form for that too it's yeah. A, yeah it's a beautiful geometrical form mm. it has some colors in it it's nice well i mean <laughs> See how you, you it have is. this but you can be more strict on what forms there are there could be more like particular archetype forms like humans so if you would instead. argue okay so if you would steel man plato uh, arguing for classical culture, you would say that uh, there's one form for a human being and that is quite far removed from uh, Giacometti or Matisse or whatever, yeah. because it just doesn't look as a yeah. realistic human being. Yeah. So you need to find that balance of it actually being mm. recognizable for us mm. and being general enough, but not specific enough. So it becomes this eternal recognizable form. Mm. 
And you could have one for humanity, for example. So one, every one of us is part of this one form human. Uh, but you could also have individual forms. You have like Jan Ove, the form of Jan Ove. You have the form of Bork. Maybe even of me. And then... I doubt it. <laughs> and then you could... Uh, uh, yeah, so you need to individuate the forms. But that's a complicated thing. Let's, you could just focus on approaching <laughs> I mean, them, which I think is... I think it's a cool idea. Approach to but, forms. Uh, I, I think so much more constructive the uh, approach to try to f try to see, try to find God in everything. Mm. Uh, William said it so beautifully. Yeah. Uh, Who says that? Instead of talking about this, William Heimdall. Instead of talking about this other realm where the perfect forms are, and and I mean, who who is going to tell us what they look like? Well, no, no one, no one can. The philosopher kings can yeah. uh, maybe hint at something. Maybe they can mm. have a high in the understanding of it but to 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 see god in every object in nature that that should be the and be there's the. a way of doing that for plato i mean he has this one big idea of one form in the end which is the good so if you say exactly that but you take away god and you say the good then you can say see the form of the good in everything mm. that's, a, that's not a bad idea you strive for it you go in the woods and you see a tree like Dostoevsky says in Idiot, you can't pass the tree without thinking life's great because you see the tree. See the good in that tree. And then it's like, you see God in that tree. You could say God or good, I don't care. <laughs> that, perhaps Plato cares. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but then you can have the one idea, ideal form in the end that you see in everything. I think that yeah, but, but then, God is a good rule as well. Just see God because God is just... It's the good, isn't it? So maybe it's the same? Or, or not. I mean, many people who have had near-death experiences say that good and bad, the, they are both equally uh, necessary. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, Heraclitus' uh, point that, uh, that uh, this book is, uh, it, it's a book and it's also not a book. Up because, is down, he says. Yeah, because it's, is uh, everything is uh, constantly changing into something else. This is actually what Plato raged against. Uh, and that's why he created this uh, world of forms. But I, I, I think that's uh, an interesting uh, idea. I, I, I agree with you, actually, on this one. I, I taught Heraclit, Heraclitus. Yeah, Heraclitus. Is that the English yeah. word? Heraclitus. I, I taught him last week. To my students, we read all the all the sentences from Heraclitus, and he has this, I think, very cool picture that the instead of, so as opposed to Plato, he has this idea where reality in itself, as Plato would say, is the forms. He said Heraclitus says that it's just unknown. We can never know the reality in itself, and everything changes into everything all the time. So, as you said, it just goes in cycles back and forth and it's fire one moment and water the next moment and, yeah. and everything is just flowing. You can step into the same river twice, but you have this, there's some constant effect to it as well. There's something constant there, yeah. but it keeps changing. No, yeah, he says, it's he like says, that slippery fish. It's like <laughs> you can't grip it. He says that the changes, that the water flows through the river, that makes it into a, 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 something constant, the yeah. river. But the water flows through it. It's not the same river, but it is a river because of yeah. the constant change. But he also said that this logos, this word or logos, this underlying truth, that which is unknown, is ruling the world. And we should always, we, sh we can't know it, but it is ruling the world. So we should always try to just adapt to what we see and hear and, and be very empirical about what goes on around us, uh, because it's unknowable. What you try to do, if you're a great poet or a great painter, is what we talked about earlier, if that's true, that I said earlier, that you sort of strive to create the form, the ideal version of what you're making. If that's the case, and you add Heraclitus' worldview to this, that's a great job for the artist to make that river last. So the river is always changing. It's always flowing. It's always the banks are changing a little bit because of the water. It's never the same river. But at the same time, it is the same. So what's the sameness here? That's not changing because everything's changing. Well, that's sort of like if you can capture that on a canvas 
or in the poem, you sort of make that river last, even though it's changing. So it's a great job for poets to, to make the river last, because it, it's sort of sad to think that everything changes all the time. Ne nothing ever lasts, even no, not even the good stuff. Well, make a portrait, make it last, you know, recreate Jan Uwe in a portrait, hang it on the wall and it lasts longer than you. I think that's a beautiful vision. That's why I like Heraclitus. Yeah.